All right, hello and welcome to our first press conference of the Ocean Sciences meeting, Emerging Plastic and Chemical Contaminants in Coastal Ecosystems. Our speakers this morning will be Elise Granick from Portland State University, Amy Earhart from Portland State University, Britta Beckler from Portland State University, and Veronica Padula from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Hi, welcome. Uh, so I'm going to, my name is Elise Granick, and I'm a professor at uh, Portland State University in the Environmental Science and Management Department. Um, and I'm gonna speak about emerging contaminants in our oceans, uh, where they are, what we find, and why it matters. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So we conducted a review, and uh, Arben Pont et al. have also conducted a review looking at where we find contaminants in our oceans. Um, and this map represents, um, this, this is a map representing Arpin Pont et al.'s work, which was a little more recent than ours. Um, and what we see is that <clears throat> when uh, sampled, uh, when, or, when marine animals are sampled, we see emerging contaminants in most of the places that they are studied, uh, which include North America, South America, Europe, and Asia, as, including Australia. Um, and we see this big gap in um, Africa and in the Arctic Ocean. And this doesn't represent a lack of contaminants. It represents a lack of study of those areas. Um, <clears throat> in terms of where, we also see, uh, we also find these, compact, these various chemical contaminants across a variety of marine ecosystems. Um, maybe less surprisingly, we find them in harbors and estuaries and bays close to human populations. Um, as well as coastal areas, but we're also finding them increasingly in the open sea, in the high seas, and there was a study um, that came out last year from a different lab um, and different university that found them in, the deep, ocean, in deep ocean organisms as well. Um, so again, where we look, we seem to be finding this array of con emerging contaminants. So we specifically in our lab have looked um, at, at pharmaceuticals, um, and microplastics, and Britta will be talking about microplastics that we've looked at um, in, here in Oregon, and, in, and we've done some work in Washington. Um, and what we see is an array of contaminant types, of chemical types. Um, and when we look at pharmaceuticals, we find things ranging from antibiotics that we use uh, to treat bacterial infections, uh, antihistamines, such as the active ingredient in Benadryl, uh, diuretic medications um, used for edema and congenital heart failure, um, we find anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and naproxen, things that we're all familiar with and have most of us have probably used at some point. Um, we also find sulfa drugs um, and Virginia mycin, which is an interesting antibiotic in that it's used primarily in livestock re uh, rearing and in fuel ethanol. Um, we've also found some legacy contaminants and some other emerging contaminants, but again, focusing on pharmaceuticals here. So why does it matter if we find these really low concentrations or really low levels of these pharmaceuticals? Well, first of all, they are intended to be biologically active compounds, right? They were made to, have, to elicit a response in bodies of animals or humans. Um, and so because of that, we are interested in whether and how exposure to these uh, compounds affect marine animals. Um, and so we've conducted a, no a number of studies in the lab, um, and unfortunately, in each study that we conduct, we see that there are biological effects um, of exposure of very low concentrations. So we, say we all of our experiments are with concentrations that have been measured in the environment. So they're um, what we call environmentally relevant concentrations. Um, and we assess, we conduct experiments to assess the effects on organisms. Um, and we've worked primarily in the lab with um, Prozac and antibiotics. We're just starting to study microplastics as well in the lab. Um, but what we see is that um, in terms of Prozac, the first bullet and the last bullet, um, Prozac, uh, long-term exposure to Prozac at very low doses affects muscle feeding, growth, and reproduction. Um, and uh, when we expose uh, shore, Oregon shore crabs to Prozac, um, we see big spikes in their activity level, and we see an increase in boldness around predators, this behavior that's not natural for them. Um, and what the consequence is, is we see more loss of limbs and death in those small shore crabs when they're exposed to predators because they become more bold around their, I'm sorry, in, of prey because they, because they become more bold around their predators. Um, we've also looked at antibiotics and how antibiotic exposure, again, at very low concentrations, affect 
um, algal growth and muscle growth, um, and we see reductions in both when they're exposed to antibiotics. Um, and we also see effects of antibiotics on the reproduction of muscles. So in summary, um, when we look at emerging contaminants in the ocean, we are finding them worldwide and likely increasingly. Um, we are finding that they have a, what we call species and ecosystem level effects, or in other words, they affect individual or groups of animals, and they also in affect the interactions between animals, as, as exemplified by that crab study. Um, and what we don't know is how much ecosystem level effect or how much they may be affecting organisms that aren't actually accumulating them in their tissue, um, these chemicals in their tissue, but are connected via the food web. Um, we also, a big data gap is un understanding the human health effects, and we really don't understand or know how um, exposure of the exposure in marine animals that are human foods of, and then are consumed by humans, how that affects um, human health. Um, and I just want to mention one potential solution that Amy will touch on a bit more. Um, one of the main issues of her pharmaceutical contamination in the ocean is improper disposal. Um, so sometimes we're told by pharmacists even um, to flush our extra pharmaceuticals down the drain. Um, and that is a perfect pathway for them entering our aquatic environments and the ocean. Um, and so instead, you know, we're really encouraging folks to um, look for alternative um, solutions, and those can include drop boxes at pharmacies and pickup events um, so that we don't end up with um, fish that are contaminated with a series of contaminants. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions at the end. Um, there's my contact info, and I will pass it on to Amy. All right, I'm Amy Earhart. I'm a PhD student at Portland State University, uh, and I work with Elise Granick. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about my research on um, contaminants in Pacific oysters that are near and far from wastewater in Oregon and Washington. Uh, so I'll start with some results. Uh, so in transplanted Pacific oysters in Oregon and Washington, um, we found pharmaceuticals and chemicals used in household and industrial products in their tissues. Uh, and we find that location matters. So for pharmaceuticals, levels were higher in oysters that were placed near wastewater treatment plant outfall pipes. Um, but for household and industri industrial chemicals, we found these at all of our study sites. So we find that they're more widespread, widespread at various um, Areas. So how did we um, find these compounds? Um, so I conducted an experiment in Oregon and Washington uh, in these estuaries in Grays Harbor, Neatarts Bay, and Coos Bay. Uh, so oysters were specifically placed at areas near wastewater treatment plant outfall pipes and then at reference sites which have little or no wastewater influence. And the reason we're focusing on wastewater um, is that products and pharmaceuticals are used in households and then flushed or washed away to a wastewater treatment plant um, where they go through the filtration process and often they're not removed during that process and then they are released into the environment. So this research is important for several reasons. Um, first of all, amounts of these compounds in marine environments in Oregon are not well understood. Um, there are also a lack of federal guidelines for safe levels of compounds in the environment. Um, and then there are potential negative effects on marine life, which Elise talked a bit about, some of those effects that we've seen in the lab. So a few things that you can do to help with this issue. Um, you can dispose of your unused pharmaceuticals properly, uh, so by taking them to a drug take-back box um, rather than flushing them down the toilet or pouring them in the sink. Um, and you can also be a diligent consumer by doing research on the products that you're using in your household and the ingredients in those products. All right, here's my contact information, um, and I'd be happy to take questions at the end.
just a second. All right. Uh, hello, my name is Britta Beckler, and I'm a PhD student at Portland State University. Um, I adv I'm advised by Dr. Elise Granick, who's also sitting on this panel. Um, and today I'm here talking to you about the first chapter of my dissertation, which is looking at microplastics in two Oregon bivalve species. So right off the bat, what did we find? Um, Oregon Pacific oysters do contain microplastics. Um, so my, my study was conducted at a total of 15 sites along the Oregon coast. Six of those so sites were oyster sites and nine of them were razor clam sites. Um, I have not been able to analyze razor clams yet and still have about 60 oysters to analyze, so these results are preliminary and I'll only be discussing the oyster results today. So our preliminary results, um, I have split the sites uh, into northern and southern sites. So the northern three sites, those are north of about Florence on the Oregon coast. The southern sites are then south of Florence. So what we found is the average number of microplastics per oyster for the northern sites is just over about 14. Um, for reference, an average oyster in my study weighs about 30 grams. Um, the southern sites have slightly fewer at about 13.7 microplastics per oyster. Um, for the minimum and maximum number of microplastics I've observed, uh, the minimum number in northern sites has been two with a maximum of 38 per individual. Um, the southern sites have a slightly larger range from min to max. Now, a lot of studies actually standardize the number of microplastics by the weight of the organism you're studying. So this average number of microplastics per gram of tissue in the northern sites is about 0.61 pieces of plastic per gram. And in the southern sites, it's slightly less at, at 0.45. And then similarly, the northern sites have slightly longer average microplastic length than do the southern sites. And of note is microplastics are present in oysters at all six sites that I studied. So sort of how do we stack up to other places in the world in terms of microplastic concentrations in our bivalves? Well, this chart here shows us um, various clam species, as those are in orange. Pacific oysters in gray and mussel species in blue. Um, you can see the country or area where the organisms were taken from the wild um, there on the left. And as you can see, Oregon kind of falls mid-range um, on this scale. So this is not an exhaustive list of all the studies on bivalves, but it sort of is representative of the studies that are out there. Um, and on the right-hand side over here, these are images I took of actual microplastics in Oregon oysters. Um, this top one here is about one and a half millimeters in length. This one's about two millimeters, and this is a similar, similar size. So I'm sure you guys know what microplastics are, but in case you don't, um, it's a size category for pieces of plastic. Um, so microplastics are classified uh, between 101 nanometers to about 5 millimeters in size. Um, they're transmitted to the environment in a variety of different ways. They can be transmitted through rivers, through wastewater treatment plant outfall pipes, um, where wastewater from our washing machines and showers are transmitted. Um, they can be broken down from larger pieces of plastic through marine debris or um, fishing, derelict fishing gear or garbage that's sort of been transmitted through the wind. So why are they harmful? Um, we'll, we'll get a little bit more information on this later, but uh, microplastics do sorb contaminants. So contaminants stick to these plastics. And not only that, but plastics contain, by nature, uh, plasticizers and additives, and that's sort of in the plastic manufacturing process that those chemicals are introduced. Um, a growing body of literature supports that more marine organisms mistake these pieces of plastic for food items. And that same body of literature tells us that plastics disrupt endocrine, reproductive, and immune systems, uh, and can affect behavior, growth, and fitness of the organisms that take them up. Um, they've been found in a large variety of organisms from plankton to fish, uh, bivalves, sea turtles, sharks, marine mammals, and birds as well. So in summary, Oregon Pacific oysters do contain microplastics. These are my preliminary results again, but that's what we found so far. Um, this study provides an important baseline 
for microplastics in Oregon bivalves. Uh, to date, there's no other information on microplastics in our seafood items in Oregon. Uh, and lastly, the razor clams from the study will be analyzed shortly, once I get some time uh, later on this year. Uh, these are my partners in funding. I was funded by Oregon Sea Grant. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks to everybody on the panel for making my job easy because they provided lots of background about contaminants and microplastics, so I can just jump right in. We're gonna take you to a different place in the world. We're gonna go to the Bering Sea in Alaska, and my work focuses on Alaskan seabirds that we are finding evidence of plastic ingestion and exposure to harmful chemicals in. Um, right, forgot to introduce myself. Veronica. I'm Veronica. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, and I also work for the Aleut community of St. Paul Island in Alaska. So for this research, we have been working on this project for nearly the past 10 years, looking at seabirds, and in the process we have been examining what they've been eating. So far we've looked in 402 stomachs representing 24 species of birds. And we have found material that's clearly not food, something inorganic, in about 108 individuals. So about a quarter of the birds we've looked at so far have had something inorganic in their, in their stomach. Many times it's something made of plastic. So what you can see in this picture here is the stomach contents from a parakeet auklet. That's the little guy on the left. And those small pieces of plastic are called nurdles. And that ended up in one bird's stomach. Bear in mind that this bird is only about this big and all of that was inside of its stomach, which is kind of bad news for that bird. So these are all microplastics that we're finding for the most part in our bird's stomachs, and while they might not always cause physical harm because they are so small, the question becomes what happens when the plastic is inside the bird's stomach? Because, as Britta said, Plastics can absorb chemicals from the marine environment, and they're also coated in additives. So we look at a particular plastic-associated chemical called phthalates, which are those plasticizing chemicals. So you can see in here, you have these small pieces of microplastics inside the stomach of a northern fulmar. And that is really the sort of the regular thing that we're finding in our birds. Just to give you sort of a visual of what plastics can do, they basically act like sponges when they're in the environment. They're these porous materials, they form a matrix when the chemicals come together and like other chemicals can sort of find spaces in between and soak it all up. Um, there's research that comes out of California that says depending on the type of plastic we're looking at, whether we're looking at number one, number two, number three plastic, the rate at which it can absorb different chemicals varies. Um, and one of the biggest chemicals that they're finding can be absorbed by plastics are persistent organic pollutants, which are known cancer-causing agents. So when a bird might mistake a piece of plastic for food or might eat a fish that has plastic in it, what happens is that plastic gets inside its stomach, all those stomach juices kind of start working on that piece of plastic and the chemicals that are in the plastic and on the plastic can leach off and get into the bloodstream of the bird and also get into its tissues. And this is problematic because some of the birds I study are subsistence species. They're eaten by people who live in um, the Bering Sea region. The other thing that we're finding is that these chemicals can move into reproductive tissues like eggs and those eggs are also consumed. So these chemicals are moving into spaces that um, are consumed by humans as well. The other thing is that these chemicals are endocrine disruptors. So I like to call them hormone imposters. They're basically like a skeleton key. Our hormones are these chemicals that meet up with our cells and they unlock these doors on the cell and get inside to do whatever they need to do. But these phthalates, these skeleton keys can also do that. And that's problematic because when those, um, when those endocrine disrupting compounds get into the cell, they can interrupt metabolic processes, they can have negative impacts. Um, what we see in the literature with human medical um, research is that they are related to higher rates of infertility, um, they are related to other reproductive issues. Um, also, 
earlier puberty um, is one thing that has been uh, sort of suggested to correlate with exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds. What it does for seabirds in the Bering Sea, we're not sure yet because we haven't gotten to that point in terms of exposure studies and understanding the real impacts of these chemicals on these birds. So the takeaway. Um, Bering Sea seabirds are ingesting plastics and they're getting exposed to these plastic associated chemicals. So far in our research, we've detected these chemicals, these phthalates, in 111, 111 individuals. Um, five of the birds that we've tested so far had phthalates below the level of detection, which means that we can't determine whether or not they were actually exposed to these chemicals because the, um, the machine that we're using can only go to a certain point below, the, and below that we're not sure if it's actually there or not. Um, and the patterns of our data suggest that there's no geographic variation in exposure across the Bering Sea region, and also that biomagnification or um, increasing concentrations of these chemicals in birds that are higher up on the food chain are occurring. But we're still working on those bits and pieces to tease out those um, patterns. So with that, I'll say thank you, and um, hopefully we can open up for questions. Okay, cool. We will now go to uh, questions from any reporters. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Virginia Guillen. I'm freelance. Um, Veronica, really quick, you said you've been doing this over a 10-year period, I believe. Have you seen an increase over time in the ingestion of plastics? That's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, no. The problem with that is that Every year, so, so sort of a background to how we collect our specimens is we work with the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge, which um, manages all the land in the Aleutian Island chain. They have a research vessel called the Tekla that takes us out to these islands. And each year, we're sort of stowaways, um, each year we get on the boat and we get to the islands that we can access via the ship. And so in different years, we've collected specimens from different islands it's a pretty long island chain, and so the geographic variation can spread. And so it's hard to sort of tease out a spatial or a temporal component to plastic ingestion because of the sort of opportunistic sampling that we've done. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Hi, uh, my name is Mary Miller. I'm at the Exploratorium. I'm interested uh, with the pharmaceuticals you'd mentioned, you know, disposing of them properly. Um, what about excretion and wastewater treatment? Is that also um, an issue? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yes. So generally, the human body does not metabolize all of a pharmaceutical that you take in, and so we do excrete some of those compounds in an active form, and some of the breakdown products are. Um, for some of these compounds actually more um, toxic to marine animals than the actual compound. Um, and so yes, part of the problem is that um, whether it's through excretion of small amounts or through improper disposal of larger amounts, it's uh, these compounds are entering the wastewater treatment plants which don't have the capacity in most cases to break them down. Um, again, they're biologically active, and so the bacteria, the bacterial stage of breakdown at wastewater treatment plants doesn't necessarily break them down into a non-active form. So that for what, what has been studied in wastewater treatment plant effluent is that um, these compounds, either their initial form or their breakdown products are being released in the effluent water post-treatment. Um, so that's a great question. It is another source, but it's sort of the same source as this improper disposal, but probably lower concentration since our body does take up some of the pharmaceutical that we ingest. Rick Lovett, Freelance. Uh, I have uh, two kind of related questions for you. Uh, one is a follow-up to that, um, which is what could be done with wastewater treatment plants to fix this, um, and how much would it cost? Um, and as long as I have this now, the other one, which is what I intended to ask, um, is the freshwater folks have been chasing these things for quite a while with studies in zebrafish and things like that. Yeah. How new is the findings in the ocean? Um, let me take that one first because that's easier. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say that the study in marine environments is a bit newer than in the aquatic environment. So when we conducted a, the review in 
we started the review in 2015, I believe, a literature review, and there were um, hundreds, maybe a thousand of s studies in the aquatic environment and um, on the order of dozens to a hundred studies in the marine environment. So it's definitely, an, I would say, a newer science in the ocean. Um, and you see that with the microplastics as well. I feel like <clears throat> every month or so I hear a new study of uh, findings on microplastics in some new marine organism or some new location. Um, and so I think that studying these things in the ocean um, is newer perhaps because we expected to see them in aquatic environments. And so aquatic uh, ecologists and bio biogeochemists and ecotoxicologists started looking there. Um, and then the question is, oh, wow, well, if they're so ubiquitous in the aquatic environment, are they also downstream? And they are. Um, so hopefully that answered the second question. As to what wastewater treatment plants can do and how much it would cost, that is a great question that I would defer to an engineer. Um, I have had a couple engineers approach me saying they would love to, you know, or engineering student, grad students, I should say, approached me saying they would love to figure out how to design something to treat the effluent in a way that would remove these compounds. But again, that is really outside of my area of expertise. So I have no idea how much it would cost. Um, but I will say that, sorry, this kind of not answering your question um, or adding to my answer of your question, but in addition to um, the wastewater treatment plants not sufficiently treating pharmaceuticals. Most wastewater treatment plants also don't have the capacity to um, appropriately uh, treat microplastics as well. So it's not just the pharmaceuticals that are coming out in the effluent, but we also see microplastics in the effluent water. Um, and there's some great work from, uh, shoot, I can't think of the lake. There's one of the lakes in upstate New York where they've looked at um, they've been looking at the food webs in the lake and also looking at effluent water, um, and they find microplastics in the effluent water and then in the sediment and then in the organisms. Um, so yeah, so it's an issue both for the pharmaceuticals and for the microplastics. Hi, um, Janessa Duncombe, freelance. Um, I have a question for Amy Earhart. Um, yeah, so when you uh, talk about diligent consumers, um, do you have any tips for you know interested consumers of resources they could look into to figure out which household chemicals, which products are really safe or not? Um, yeah. That's a great question, and uh, it's not my expertise to make specific recommendations um, about household products, um, but there is information. Um, on the internet, if you search for different compounds or specific products, you can find what is in them and maybe some better recommendations for what to use instead. Okay, are there any other questions? I guess of the, the work that your group has done, um, is there you know one particular pharmaceutical or chemical that stands out either as does the worst damage or most prevalent, you know, those kinds of things. Like, what are the hot spots that you're finding? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I would say that the compound that's the most ubiquitous are these nonalphenols, the alkyl phenols. So they are surfactants, so, and that's the chemical group. <clears throat> excuse me, that Amy was referring to from her work. Um, and there have been a number of studies down in California as well. I'm not aware of any up in Washington, but I know, you know, along this coast, there have been a series of studies looking at these surfactants that are used in, I think they're now mostly phased out of laundry detergents, but they're still in sink cleaners, and they're in some random things that I wouldn't have expected, like shoes, and they're in indoor bug sprays. Um, and they seem to be very ubiquitous in the environment. Um, and so there is a lot of, um, and, they're in the, and they are endocrine disruptors. So there's a lot of um, research across the world showing that they're present in aquatic and marine environments. Um, and because of the endocrine disrupting nature of them, um, I think that that's problematic. Um, I guess I will also say that I think one of our, um, one of the things we're cognizant of is that as the coastal population, human population grows around the world, um, and as pharmaceuticals become, use becomes more widespread, I think one of our questions is, is that going to lead to more exposure of these, um, of exposure by marine animals to these pharmaceuticals? Um, and again, there's, um, 
we see them more, the pharmaceuticals are present in a more spotty manner. So wh where we've sampled across sites and across seasons, we'll see some compounds in some seasons at some sites and other compounds in other seasons at other sites. And so it's a little bit harder to say how problematic they are because at the moment, they, at least on our coast in Oregon where it's not that heavy of a population density, it's more spotty. Um, but I will say even, um, I think Virginia, you know that we have done some research on caffeine and even caffeine we find in our ocean here off of Oregon and even caffeine has biological effects when we expose mussels to it. So, you know, regardless of which compound, <coughs> excuse me, we're looking at, when we expose organisms or animals to these compounds um, sort of in an unintended way, they often do have biological effects. So I don't know if I answered your question, but... That's great. I just, I guess I'm curious, just given this winter and the flu season and just all the sickness, I'm, I'm curious about just the time cycle too, because if there's, you know, this massive um, prescription rates of antibiotics mm -hmm. in the winter, right. is that just the perfect amount of time for all of that to flush into the marine environment in spring and do some serious damage? Is there like any kind of interesting time series that you're uncovering? Yeah, so we did some work in, um, we looked at oysters and neat tarts in Coos Bay several years ago and what we did find, we worked with Oregon Department of Environmental Quality and um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and what we did find was that there were more compounds more types of compound, more types of pharmaceuticals, and higher, slightly higher levels um, in spring, and then second, the second most um, diverse pharmaceutical sampling was in summer, and then in fall we didn't find very many compounds. So I think we do see again we only sampled for one year, so we had three seasons across one year. Um, so it would be, it, I think it's a great question of how whether we see that seasonality. Um, if we sample more consistently across years, but my guess is that um, that that is happening. That probably in the sp in the fall there's a lot less present in the marine environment, and in the spring and summer from these um, seasonal use patterns that we see more. Rick Lovett again. Um, I um, so uh, a follow up on my question uh, from before. Uh, so we've seen this initially in the um, freshwater environment. Now you're seeing it on the coasts. Um, you know, are we going to find it in the deep seas, which we kind of, I would have thought it would dilute it to nothing out there, but I'm now wondering. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I, I'm, no studies are coming to mind specifically on pharmaceuticals in the deep sea, but I will say that there was a study that came out of I think Canada last fall that looked at um, sea stars and another invertebrate species, I'm not remembering what, but a couple, couple species of deep sea sea stars and then a couple of other invertebrate species. Um, and they were looking at microplastics specifically. And I wanna say that in at least 20, it's somewhere between 25 and 40% of their samples. I'm not remembering the exact number. I should have looked that up. I can, I can find the study for you. But um, they found microplastics in these deep sea organisms. And these were organisms that they were collecting on submersible dives. Um, and so yes, I would have expected there to be much better, much um, more dilution, and we wouldn't be seeing those concentrations, but it seems at least in their study site, oh, maybe it was, it was off of Scotland, actually. Um, uh, but even in their study site, at least in their study sites, they were seeing fairly high um, contamination levels of microplastics in these organisms. So I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, again, I think we're we're missing data on the pharmaceutical piece. Um, but the fact that we're seeing these microplastics is probably an indication that there's other things too. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Are there any questions on the chat? No? Okay, great. That concludes our press conference. Thank you very much.